Hi, my name is Dr. Ross Hauser. Welcome to the Hauser Next Center here in Fort Myers, Florida. Today's video is really one of the more important ones, especially with all the things that are going on in the world, and it's on the vagus nerve vasospasm connection. And I don't know if you've noticed, but in the news, there's just more and more sad stories of for like no apparent reason somebody died you know like and and then in the news if you research it we're seeing more and more reports on sudden adult death syndrome now we all have heard about sudden infant death syndrome where a baby like is just found dead in the crib right and that is like awful but now we're finding uh where for no apparent reason somebody died. So I'm gonna tell a, I'm gonna tell a couple stories that led me to make this video. Let me first define a vasospasm and we'll look at it. And then I just wanna tell some stories of why this means a lot to me, this topic. We see here that there's a blood vessel with blood cells in it and it's narrowed right there. So vasospasm is that there's a certain diameter of an artery, all of a sudden it narrows, and then what happens is the blood cells accumulate there because you know it'd be like there's three lanes on the highway and one or two of the lanes are blocked, and then all of a sudden all these cars are trying to get into the lane that's open. So you could see where right here the blood flow could get blocked and then the person, like if it's their heart, they have an ischemic attack, which we call angina, and it feels the exact same way as a heart attack feels because it's the same pathophysiology. It's like there's, there's not blood supply going to the heart. So often the person goes to the emergency room, and by the time they go to the emergency room, the attack's over typically. But you understand the danger of this, that the person could get a heart attack even though they don't have any plaque, they don't have calcium in their arteries. It's a involuntary contraction of the artery, and it has the potential to cause death of the organ that it's supplying. Like if this was to be the liver organ and the blood supply to the liver organ got shut off, of course you'd get death of the liver or part of the liver. So it can occur in any, any organ. So years ago when I was in my internship at Loyola Medical Center, Heinz VA Medical Center in Chicagoland, I did one month of neurosurgery. So one of the cases that I was on as an intern was a totally healthy gentleman came in and he had lost consciousness and then they found out that he had a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So in other words, he had a brain bleed and I was actually in the surgery with him and it was an, it was an emergency. So in other words, a uh, artery in his brain burst and the mortality when it first happens is 50%. So he had already made it to the 50%. So I was in the surgery with the team and I saw the whole operation where they had to very carefully go into the brain and find where that little artery is and then they had to clip it. And at any time during that surgery, the little blood clot that was keeping that artery uh, closed at the time, it could go off and then the person would die instantly on the table. So they say it's like the hardest brain surgery to do. So they clipped it and now the person goes into recovery. So you would think like, oh my gosh, the, the surgery was great, the person's going to do spectacular. But what happens is sometimes unbeknownst to anybody of why it happens that the person starts getting vasospasm in the brain. So I think it was like on day two, the person started to decline. And so basically over the course of several days, I saw the family and us 
on the neurosurgical team go from elation to like, oh, the, the surgery went well, to every day a certain part of the brain started to die. And I remember the resident saying to me if I would go to them when he told the family that their, their husband, their father, uh, no longer existed because he was 100% brain dead. So I, I distinctly remember that, that conversation. So subarachnoid hemorrhage, we're going to go back to it because some of the best research on why vasospasms occur is from subarachnoid research in, in, in rabbits. And, and so, and, and I'll just mention it now, the rabbit studies have shown that the amount of subarachnoid hemorrhage induced vasospasm correlated with the amount of vagus nerve degeneration. So that's going to be a common thing, vagus nerve degeneration, vagus nerve degeneration. So if you have a history of vasospasm or you've been diagnosed with angina or there's a lymph node that has necrosed or an organ that's necrosed and nobody can find the cause, it is likely that it's uh, vagus nerve uh, degeneration. And I'll just tell you one story. Of course, I got lots of stories, which is why these videos take so long. But they're interesting because they give you some insight into what's causing human disease. So a family, I, no, I was notified of a family. So they're, they're basically family members of really good friends of ours. And the daughter was in the hospital basically dying, like it was really, really severe, that the, they, basically the whole internal organs of the child, I think she's like 18, uh, was shutting down and different organs were atrophying like the pancreas. And I explained to the family, especially the mother, of how vagus nerve degeneration can cause this. And I said, it's usually the right vagus nerve. And I said, like basically, the vagus nerve is going to get compressed like if the person's like this and the mother admitted that that's exactly how her daughter in her hospital bed was and she had been this way for a long long time and then I explained to her well why don't you do the opposite where you keep this part of the neck open and just see what happens and I talked to the mother like a week ago and it was like miraculous you know it's just miraculous like her digestive tract just by getting the pressure off of the vagus nerve it was like unbelievable like she was gonna die now she's prospering at home so this stuff this stuff is real so normal artery when you get vasoconstriction, the lumen of the artery gets narrowed and when there's vasodilation. So vasospasm is where the lumen is narrowing for no apparent reason, but we know the reason is vagus nerve degeneration. So coronary artery vasospasm, that's the most common type of vasospasm, is a quick tightening of the blood vessels of the heart muscle that can lead to a decrease in blood supply to the heart, causing chest pain and even a heart attack. The etiology is multifaceted. The structural dysfunction is likely to lead to vagus nerve degeneration. We know that if somebody has a food sensitivity, that can cause it. If there's a hormone problem, autoimmune problem, magnesium deficiency. In natural medicine, years ago, we would do Myers cocktail IVs or high dose vitamin, uh, high dose magnesium intravenously and have people take magnesium that helps reduce the frequency of vasospasm. Before I delve totally into vasospasm, I wanted to talk about the four types of joint instabilities that cause chest pain because it's not uncommon for people to have ligamentous joint instability causing a severe chest pain for which a person goes to the emergency room. Michael Jackson, he was in the ER at least on one occasion where he thought he was having a heart attack and he had seat seat syndrome or costochondritis. So somebody could have a instability where the sternum attaches to the, to the cartilage here so they can have sternal chondral instability or there can be a looseness where the rib attaches to the cartilage here 
the costochondral joint, and those joints are held together by ligaments. Often the person has acute, sharp, localized, superficial pain, and there's tenderness where the, where the pain is. So if you've had unresolved chest pain, you could poke on the area, and with CT syndrome or costochondritis, they'll have sharp tenderness there. Sometimes just take an ibuprofen or something resolves it. Obviously, we treat it with prolotherapy, prolotherapy injections to the site where the pain is, where there's instability can resolve it. Another cause of pain in the chest is thoracorib instability, thoracorib instability, injury to the costotransverse ligaments or the ligaments that attach the ribs to the thoracic vertebrae. And you can see there where that can cause intercostal neuritis. So the intercostal nerves that innervate the skin sensation from the thoracic area skin and the skin over the chest region here are the intercostal nerves. When there's rib instability, and you would know that there's rib instability because often you feel with motion that there's a moving, and there can even be with a deep breath, you feel that the ribs are moving. We just call that rib instability. Some people would call it slipping rib syndrome. So thoracorib instability can irritate the intercostal nerve and you can get really sharp chest pain and even shortness of breath, the treatment of that is going to be prolotherapy to where the injured ligaments are. Now, another cause of chest pain from ligamentous joint instability is cervical angina. And I've had cases of cervical angina, people feeling like, I'm having a heart attack, I'm having a heart attack. And it's basically from a pinched nerve in the lower neck. So the cause of it is lower neck instability, ligamentous injury in the lower neck. Often the people will have pain like in this region. Normally a pinched nerve in the neck, as we all know, causes pain down the arm, but we have to remember that the pectoral muscles are in the front of the chest and they're innervated by the C5 nerve, C6 nerve, C7 nerve. So usually when you have a pinched nerve in the lower neck, it causes pain into the hand or pain in the back of the neck and the upper thoracic region, but sometimes it just causes chest pain because the nerves go to the pectoral muscles. So uh, the, the way the person diagnoses that is either by an MRI. We also do digital motion x-ray, which can show that the neural foramina close with neck motions. The typical neck motion that closes the neural foramina is extension and rotation to the side of the pain. So if you have chest pain and you notice when you go like this or you go like this, the pain increases is likely that you have cervical angina. The treatment, how we treat it, is by repairing the ligaments in the base of the neck with prolotherapy. This talk specifically is on vagopathy-induced vasospasm. So upper cervical ligament joint instability can ultimately cause stretch compression of the vagus nerve. When the vagus nerve gets degenerated enough, it can cause vasospasm in various arteries, including the coronary arteries. People often say they have a severe, deep, pain that they know it's not the ribs, it's very deep into the heart, and often they feel like that they're dying. Typically with this type of chest pain, you get other vagus nerve symptoms. When you get vagus nerve degeneration, you typically get anxiety, you can get ringing of the ears, uh, you get digestive problems, sensitive stomach, bloating, constipation heart palpitations, even shortness of breath. Again, localized pain there or there with tenderness, that's costochondritis. Cervical angina can cause pain in the pectoral major or minor muscle. Typically, that's more of a superficial pain. Cervical angina is when these nerves get pinched or stretched. 
and then intercostal neuralgia. That's where pain goes from the thoracic area around to the chest that can give you chest pain. And thoracic instability can cause not just slipping rib syndrome, but other kinds of thoracic problems. And these are the tender points that you see on physical exams. So if you wonder if you have thoracic instability, you could have a friend or a spouse poke on the different areas and see if it's really, really sore in your thoracic area. Even thoracic outlet syndrome can give you chest pain. Now that chest pain typically is when the person abducts and rotates their shoulder. We're going to go back to coronary artery vasospasm. Now there's lots of different studies that have been done on vasospasm. What they found is that there definitely is precipitating factors. For instance, if there's low-grade inflammation, oxidative stress, autonomic nervous system dysfunction, but I would propose that those are all things that are caused by vagus nerve degeneration. By definition, when the vagus nerve gets degenerated, it gets smaller. So we can measure that in the office by ultrasound. You can test your vagus nerve to see how they're doing by heart rate variability. So when there's vagus nerve degeneration, the heart rate variability goes down. By definition too, if the function of the vagus nerve goes down, it means that there's going to be sympathetic hyperactivity compared to the parasympathetic or vagus nerve activity. And we all know that adrenaline or sympathetic hyperactivity causes vasoconstriction, right? You're up to bat. You know, there's two outs uh, in the ninth inning. The hands are cold and clammy. Well, why are the hands cold or clammy or whenever you're nervous is because that's sympathetic hyperactivity. So if you're somebody who always has cold hands, cold feet, Raynaud's phenomena where in cold weather you get your hands turn blue, that's a sign of autonomic hyperactivity or sympathetic hyperactivity, you probably have vagus nerve degeneration. You could look into people's eyes, right? So when you have the sympathetic system is way stronger than the parasympathetic system, your pupils dilate, right? You're nervous, you know, you're nervous, then your pupils dilate. And so if you're somebody who has light sensitivity and you notice like, man, compared to other people, my pupils are really dilated, you probably have vagus nerve degeneration. For completion's sake, there are other causes of vasospasm, including stress, early morning exertion, cold exposure. We talked about hyperventilation, uh, bearing down, like you're carrying something or you're having a bowel movement, Valsalva maneuver, magnesium deficiency we talked about, activated platelets. So if somebody has dehydration, sticky platelets, the platelets are what do clotting. There are clotting disorders that can occur with autoimmune diseases. Those can cause precipitating factors for angina. Then there's lots of different medications that unfortunately as a side effect have a vasospasm as a side effect. If say a 32 year old was to go in and had various bouts of angina, the way they would diagnose it is usually, believe it or not, just by giving nitroglycerin because nitroglycerin works so quickly, a spray or a sublingual tablet. So if somebody has a deep seated chest pain and they give nitroglycerin, often the chest pain goes away immediately. It's like unbelievable. So that's kind of diagnostic for vasospastic angina, prinzmetal angina it's also called. And then long term they normally give calcium channel blockers and they work very, very good. Now obviously I would say that shouldn't be the end all be all because what's causing the vasospasm? Because if you treat with a calcium channel blocker and you have vagus nerve degeneration caused by upper cervical instability, the vagus nerve degeneration is still going to continue. Now you may not have vasospasm, but you're going to get all the other symptoms of vagus nerve degeneration. And some of them can be catastrophic, for instance, heart arrhythmia. So 
So the way to diagnose that is in the office, we do digital motion x-ray, we measure vagus nerve function, and we test for the size of the vagus nerve. Matt, you might have the record for the least amount of time I've known you to where I'm interviewing you. So we oh, actually wow. just met, right? Didn't we, we, did. just, didn't we just met? And I told you that Izzy and I have been preparing a really good PowerPoint presentation on vasospasm. Mm -hmm. And it's unbelievable how often, and I believe God leads people here, but right. it's amazing, like we'll just, we gotta do a, a talk on vasospasm. It's almost every time like a person will come to the office with vasospasm. So yeah. why don't you just tell a little bit about your story? You know, you, you come in, you came from Ontario to here, but yeah. when did when did you start not feeling good? For sure, and uh, thanks for having me. I mean, we just met, so <laughs> yeah, just <laughs> I met. really appreciate that. Uh, and I hope people can relate to my story. And it started with uh, the COVID vaccines. I first started uh, the treatment, I think back in 2020-ish, around there. Uh, and I noticed a you got your first vaccine. First shot. vaccine, yeah. yeah. It was just nothing. Yeah, yeah. And uh, within two to four weeks, I started noticing some chest pains, and I thought maybe it's just not you know a big deal. It could be the chest, or it could even be the muscles around yeah. the heart area, like the outside where the muscles are. So I thought maybe if I just stretch or did more exercise, because. The lockdowns, no one's doing any exercises, right? So uh, we would have guessed maybe it's because of the lack of exercise that I'm having this uh, experience. And around that time, I began looking at articles saying that, you know, um, COVID vaccines are associated, especially with young males uh, of myocarditis or pericarditis. Mm -hmm. So that sort of began the curiosity in me. And then once I had these repeated episodes of chest pains. Shortness I, of breath with it too. Uh, it's more of more of a spasm. You know, if you have a muscle spasm, you can't really move, and yeah. it's like that in the chest. Okay. So I thought, how, how long would they last? They would last from an hour to maybe two hours. And you would just lay down. I would just lay down, and okay. the pain would not go away. Okay. So I thought that there's something weird. How often? How many times per day would you get them? Uh, I would get them occasionally, maybe once every three days. Okay. Or one, once a week, and it would just come and go. Did you feel like you might die? I was scared because yeah. it's coming from the heart. I've never right. had this. You, you definitely knew it was not the chest wall it was the heart. Like you definitely yeah. could feel that it was the heart. And only I could tell it because you know if I tell other people, they really won't know, right? It's just I know for myself, it's coming from within the heart. Yes. Okay. So uh, it was uh, a very traumatic and scary experience for yeah. me. So that started the the research that I've done on, on, by my own. But you did go to the emergency room, right, when it first happened? Yeah, I first went to the emergency room and they ran the echocardiogram. Mm -hmm. They ran all these systems on me and just uh, it picked up a borderline signal. Uh, some of them suggested maybe acute pericarditis. So the doctor had to read the charts even more carefully. Uh, the doc doctors in Canada, they were just trying to brush it off saying, you know what, you're a young man. Okay. We, you don't think, we don't think you have any heart condition, so we just think you need to do more exercise, get some rest, and just go home. You, they did an echocardiogram, and, and for, that was normal, right? The heart was beating normally, and the, yeah. there wasn't any structural heart problem they could find, right? Exactly. Okay. Um, so the other evidence they were looking for is uh, water coming down. So okay. if I had pericarditis, which they suspected it could have been, uh, it would normally come down to the upper part of my stomach. So they were looking for water or evidence of water. And when I went to the emergency room, bef right before that, I actually had, you know, the run. So I had to go to the washroom. So I just couldn't have give them any evidence that I had water okay. uh, coming down th through my stomach and then just com coming out okay. of my body. So How many times did you go to the emergency room? I went about four to five times. No, exactly. Because, you know, if you feel like your heart, like I might be having a heart attack or whatever. Yeah. You know, you so it was pretty dramatic. Like you were really, really worried about it. Yes. When did they first say that they think you're getting spasms? Like you're actually your coronary arteries are spasming. Yeah. Yeah. When was that? That's after I decided. You know what? Uh, I'm going to go through my connections, and I have connections in South Korea. Like I know a professor of medicine in oh, Canada, okay. and he has connections in South Korea. So uh, he connected me with a professor of medicine in Korea. And then he referred me to 
uh, one of his students it, who works at a hospital, Samsung hey, Hospital. You went to South Korea. I went to South Korea for that. Are you South Korean? I was born, yeah, I was born in Korea. You have family there? Family there, okay. uh, yeah. Good, good, good. <laughs> My parents live in Canada. However, I have relatives and okay. everyone's yes, in South so. Korea. Okay. Uh, the difference in South Korea is that their, their medical system is similar to the United States. It's semi-private. Okay. So you do pay their portions that the government pays. In Canada, we don't pay anything, right? Uh, so there's a little bit of difference. And the difficulty is that if you don't have connections, it's very difficult to get into a hospital. Okay. Uh, so through my connections, I think God led me there. I was really fortunate. Yes. I went to one of their top tier uh, hospitals in Seoul and their machines immediately picked up, you know, evidence of, you know, pericarditis. And then the doctor looked at it even further and he said, I think it's 85% vasospasm, 15% okay. um, acid reflux. So okay. that's where he gave me that diagnosis and I okay. brought the results back in Canada okay. and we did more tests and to do that is first of all I was prescribed um, uh, medication for acid reflux and that continued, um, I continued so, to have so when you took, Yeah, when you took the acid blocker to get rid of whatever little gastroesophageal reflux was there, it really didn't do anything. It didn't do anything. Okay. So then, then he said, okay, we're going to try nitroglycerin. Okay. So if you have another episode of ovarian angina, which is the chest pain, try it and if it comes if the pain goes away within a minute then i know for sure it's you know from your heart so i did that um so as soon as i got the pain i tried a spray of nitroglycerin yeah. and the pain went away within a minute awesome and the way i would describe awesome. going away is that the pain it just cancels out it's weird how i how to explain it because if you have the pain all of a sudden it just cancels out yeah uh so from there we you were just need one it. spray I, yeah, one spray. I did two sprays just, you know, making okay. sure. <laughs> and a, another trigger, right after that, uh, you, I get a massive headache. And the doctors know for sure. The moment you have a headache, it's coming from the heart. Okay. Because everything, you know, the uh, blood veins are dilated and things like that. Yeah. So it's coming from the heart. And that's how we were able to say it's vasospasm. Okay. So from there, I was prescribed medication. Uh, the uh, doctor prescribed uh, diltiazem, 120 milligram. That's what it's called. And then... Uh, they were hesitant because oh, yeah. usually these medications are given to people who are very senior, like 70 years plus. Yeah. And for a young person like me to take it, they were very concerned. And uh, they said, okay, we're going to schedule you for the um, coronary angiography. So, you know, that's very dangerous procedure. They didn't want to give it to me because okay. um, there is a okay. risk of death during okay. the procedure. And I am scheduled to get it later this year. Okay. And that's why I was really hoping to find a cause for it, right? Yes, yeah. And that's how I came to see one of your videos. You. It's the YouTube algorithm that led me to one of your presentations. Okay. And I when the first time when I saw, okay, uh, cervical instability, and then when I saw vasospasm, I knew for sure there is something because my, uh, my physiotherapist, my massage therapist, they all picked up on the fact that I had a reverse curvature of my neck. So I thought there must be something and I did the research. I read up on your videos and that's how I decided, you know what, let's go to Florida, yeah. get it treated. Here, like, no, that you did a great job with your history. Now going back in your history, like you said, you know, in 2020, mm -hmm. you said, you know, you got the vaccine and you know, from other videos I've done, like long haul COVID video that I did, that I always think there's something behind the problem and you know, you know where I'm going with this. So right. like, in other words, uh, maybe there was something already going on in your system that when you were in the room, I, you were telling me that, like whether it was 2019 or 2018, yeah. I don't know if you were studying a lot or like you had right. really bad posture, like what happened then? So tw starting July, 2019, I got a full-time job. So I started working full-time and, and- Well, explain your job. You have a significant job. <laughs> well, I, in Canada, I was a Crown Prosecutor. So essentially I, you know, helped to put bad people to jail with okay. my expertise. Thank you. And uh, uh, thank you. And um, so that's what, what my job was. And then I eventually transitioned to I'm a bilingual prosecutor for the College of Early Childhood Educators. Thank so you. essentially I helped to remove bad educators who, uh, you know, do bad things to young children. To the children. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, that's the work that I do. And that work requires me to read a lot and then be in front of a computer pretty much every day. So that's the tough part. And ever since July of 2019, I've kept doing full-time work. That's what I mean though. So before the vaccine thing, you did have this whole year, if you will, where, you know, like yeah. not realizing like, 
kind of bad posture, bad posture, bad posture. Did you get any other, did you ever have any symptoms before you had that? Like, did you have any neck pain or cracking or headache or anything? like Stiffness in the neck. Okay, so you're Absolutely. already starting to get stiffness. In I, the yeah, neck. I started getting okay. stiffness and I yeah. decided I should go see a chiropractor. And okay. then perhaps I should also mention I have a lower back pain, right? Yeah. This episode started, or this accident, I should say, started it over 22 years ago. I was lifting up something very heavy yeah. and I got a crack and okay. from there, I wasn't able to sit in a, a good posture and yeah. that led to sort of more instabilities as I was on my computer because I couldn't really yeah. sit still like this for a long period of time. So you did have some cracking, clicking, popping in your neck? Absolutely. Like um, I would describe this as a micro crack. Okay. You know, like something very small. I know right. it's coming from okay. in here and no one could hear me except myself. Right. You had some other symptoms, like you got the micro cracks, like you move your head a certain way. Yeah, yeah. And then did you have any, like was your swallowing okay, your digestion okay, oh. light sensitivity or any? For sure. Another odd symptom, which you have listed in your presentation that got that caught my attention was uh, in December of 2021. I also went to the emergency room again. This time it was because I found blood in the urine. Okay. That was a very odd symptom. And then when I went to the uh, emergency room, yeah. they've, the, the, they've the, taken samples of the urine and they found, you know, globs of uh, blood okay. and they said okay we're gonna refer you to a urologist yeah. we're gonna do the CT scan of your kidneys and everything and everything came back normal okay good so I thought what's going on here there's right. something weird something like systemic something systemic yeah. and I just couldn't know what it is the, the doctors in Canada couldn't tell what it is gotcha. so it was very frustrating experience yeah. And I decided, you know what, there's something weird. I got to keep looking. Something's behind all of this. Yeah. So that's one segment. The other segment is I also saw a gastroenterologist mm -hmm. and I've done a col colonoscopy and an endoscopy. And through that, I think that I did that in 2022, uh, I think January or March. Mm -hmm. So around there, they found a stomach ulcer. So I ha I've had difficulties uh, um, sort of digesting food as well in the past. Yeah. It's until I did the colonoscopy and endoscopy where I was able to pinpoint. Did you have a lot of pain? I had pain. Okay. Yeah, a lot of you know diarrhea, things like that. Did they get you? Did Did you get tested for H. pylori? Yes, they was found a, they okay. found H. pylori. Okay. Yeah. No, so like, and you know, when we tested you here, beside finding instability, yeah. we found that you had a lot of vagus nerve degeneration. And then right. in the vasospasm PowerPoint that we're going to do, it uh -huh. uh, will correlate vagus nerve degeneration with vasospasm. Mm -hmm. And then you and I talked about, you know, if you choose to go the prolotherapy route and the curve correction route, which of course that's what I'd recommend, is that, uh, you know, we normally would you know, treat you for, you know, four to six months. And then at that point, when you feel better, uh -huh. then we, you know, carefully wean you off of the medications. Like mm -hmm. that's the normal process. Because mm -hmm. I don't think a person coming here, like right away, you get off of all your medications. Like, you know, because because yeah. if all you change is what we're doing, like we don't change anything else. You just just change like the way your computer is. We change, you know, we give you some exercise and do prolotherapy. Uh -huh. Then if you're better, you know, you know it's the changes you made. For you know, sure. and if you're worse, then well, you got to call me and see <laughs> see what we have to change. But yeah, and I look forward to the treatment plan because I know for sure you have picked up, you know, degeneration in the vagus nerve, right? Yeah, and I'm convinced that okay. there has to be something with there okay. in the instability and the impingement of the nerve. Uh, that is causing these systemic issues, very unusual symptoms that you know I've experienced. Yeah, but in the I past. think you'll see though that this vasal spasm, because you know there's not a lot of uh, there's not a lot of videos on vagus nerve degeneration called causing vasal spasm. Yeah, but vasal spasm are actually very common, yeah. and we haven't talked about this, but you understand you theoretically could get vasospasm of the arteries to your kidneys, which theoretically could cause hematuria or, or mm. blood in the urine. Right. Like we haven't talked about that. Right. But because, you know, when a person has vasospasm here, you got to realize it can occur anywhere in the body. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So. And it's through meeting doctors like you and other doctors that I've met their expertise through it that I was able to sort of at least, you know, know what's going on, even yeah. the term of vasospasm. Nobody knows what it is, right? Yeah. You just don't come across these yeah. things like varian angina, yeah. none of that. 
you just have chest pains you know where you don't know where it's coming from yeah so it's it's been a very long journey yeah and i'm so fortunate to you know find you and find all the doctors that have you know helped me in this journey i no, appreciate that matt and uh, we just thank you for sharing your story oh yeah my pleasure This is just a study that showed that mental stress definitely can be a precipitating factor for vasospasm. This is basically the pathophysiology of subarachnoid hemorrhage and all the inflammation in the brain that it causes. Remember I gave the case history of the gentleman that had died because of subarachnoid hemorrhage induced vasospasm of his brain. So there's lots of different studies that have been done where they injected blood into the subarachnoid space into the rabbit's brains. It caused massive vagus nerve no-dose ganglion degeneration. And this caused vasospasm all over the body. And depending on where the vasospasm was, for instance, if it was in a lymph node, the lymph node died. If it was in the liver, the liver died. If it was in the kidney, the kidney died. So if you're somebody who has kidney disease and nobody can figure out the cause, well, it may be that you have vagus nerve degeneration. You might be somebody who has angina attacks of the heart and nobody can figure out the cause. Well, you might have vasospasm induced by vagus nerve degeneration from problems in your neck. And in the animal studies, the nodose ganglion is the vagus nerve ganglion that sits right in front of the atlas or C1. So the DNA of the vagus nerve sits right in front of the atlas, which is the top vertebrae. And the more that ganglion cells were degenerated, the more likely it was that the animal died and they died from coronary vasospasm. And likewise, the more the vagus nerve cells died by the red, the more likely it was that the animal died. So I just wanna go through vagus nerve and the vagus nerve degeneration because it totally correlates with uh, vasospasm. You might say, come on doc, how, is there other signs or symptoms that I might have vagus nerve degeneration. So let's go through what does the vagus nerve do. So the vagus nerve originates from the brainstem. The nodose ganglion sits right in front of C1 and it innervates all the organs. So somebody with liver disease, pancreas disease, gallbladder disease, small intestine disease, duodenum disease, stomach disease, heart disease, heart arrhythmia, kidney disease, lung disease, asthma, hyperactive airway, pleural effusion, uh, pericardial effusion of the heart. Somebody who's been told, well, you might have long haul COVID. All these things are likely from, in my opinion, a vagus nerve degeneration. And these are some of the references if you wanna research them. There's about 100,000 vagus neurons or nerve cells that innervate the 500 million enteric neurons that go to your digestive tract. So every time a vagus neuron is knocked out, it's gonna knock out about 5,000 uh, neurons or nerve cells to the digestive tract. And when those neurons get knocked out, you get increased intestinal permeability. So if you've been diagnosed with leaky gut or you think you have leaky gut or you've been told you have fibromyalgia or you have too much inflammation in your body, it's likely that you have vagus nerve degeneration causing leaky gut, causing systemic inflammation because substances are getting into your bloodstream that shouldn't. And these are all the things the vagus nerve cells do. Immune surveillance, people with cancer, right? If you research heart rate variability in cancer, you'll see there's a direct correlation. So the stronger your vagus nerve is, the less likely it is you're gonna get cancer. The worse your vagus nerve is, the more likely you're gonna get diseases like cancer. The vagus nerve stimulates the immune system. It helps regulate nutrient levels, organ function, the heart, blood pressure, digestion, fluid status, hormone needs, appetite. It is basically the sensor of the body. 
So what tells the brain what's going on in the body, how much stress you're under, are you nutritionally good, do you like your job, not like your job, do you feel love, don't feel love, what tells the brain what's going on with those things is the vagus nerve. So how would your body be if the body sensor was off, if you had vagus nerve degeneration, the brain's not going to get the right information, so then the homeostasis in the body is going to be a disaster. So vagus nerve branches and symptoms. So if the vagus nerve input to the heart is not there because the vagus nerve is degenerated, you can get tachycardia, cardiomyopathy, heart arrhythmia, vasospasm, celiac spasm, bronchospasm, hepatic vasospasm. This is a very complicated diagram that I did a long time ago, but it basically shows that if you have upper cervical instability, you can get compression of the nodos ganglion, and all these things can occur. You can get torticollis, trigeminal neuralgia, light sensitivity. So if you're somebody who's had the diagnosis of Prince mental angina or you suspect vasospasm, do you have clicking, popping in the neck? Do you have tension in the upper neck? Do you have any of these other things, gastroparesis, arrhythmia? Have you been diagnosed with dystonia, depression, double vision, loss of vision, uh, you know, changes in speech, balance problems, pancreas insufficiency? It's likely that you have vagus nerve degeneration. So this is the vagus nerve uh, cross-sectional area. So this is an ultrasound image jugular vein, vagus nerve. You can see how here it's much smaller, so it's compressed there. So normal vagus nerve, vagus nerve degeneration. And then if you look at yourself in a mirror with a light and you go, ah, what's supposed to happen is both sides of the palate are supposed to elevate the same. You see this person is lower on this side, and then sometimes the uvula will deviate to one side. So deviation of the uvula to one side is a sign of vagus nerve problems. Then also if the palate is lower on one side. So the vagus nerve on the right side on this patient isn't working so good because the levator veli palatini muscle isn't working good. Other signs and symptoms of a vagus nerve problem are one pupil significantly larger than the other. The resting heart rate over 100, uvula is deviated. When you go ah, if the uvula doesn't deviate, doesn't rise a lot, that's a sign of vagus nerve degeneration. If the uvula rises more on one side versus the other, or you could say the palate doesn't rise so good on one side, and you slow your breathing down, but the heart rate does not drop, that's a sign of vagus nerve degeneration. And also, if you have unexplained anxiety, like you notice like, geez, my heart rate's going up for no reason. I'm feeling anxious for no reason. That's a sign of vagus nerve degeneration. So this is an article which showed the five mechanisms by which the vagus nerve modulates pain. So if controls inflammation, calms sympathetic nervous system, reduces oxidative stress, stimulates calming secretions of the brain, and stimulates opioid receptors. So if you're somebody who you go to a holistic provider and they say you have too much oxidative stress and you're taking antioxidants and you're eating healthy, but you probably got vagus nerve degeneration. If you've had a stool analysis, you know, genetic stool analysis, and you got all kinds of abnormal bacteria and funguses and parasites or small intestinal bowel overgrowth, and you're eating a healthy diet and taking your vitamins and it's not getting better, it's likely you have vagus nerve degeneration because the vagus nerve innervates the ileocecal valve, the pyloric valve, sphincter of OD, lower esophageal sphincter. So when you have vagus nerve degeneration, those sphincters don't work quite right. So if you have SIBO, it's likely your ileocecal valve is incompetent. So bacteria from the large intestine are going into the small intestine, and that's actually what's causing it. Important facts of the vagus nerve, very, it's very small. It innervates the, the right vagus nerve innervates the SA node, and if that 
doesn't work right, or the left vagus nerve innervating the AV node, you can get all kinds of arrhythmias. If you've been diagnosed with atrial fibrillation and your heart structure appears good, it's likely it's the nerve supply to the heart, and that's the vagus nerve. And this just shows that people with Parkinson's disease, they've shown that they have very, very small vagus nerves. So again, people with multiple sclerosis, people, their memory is failing, Parkinson's disease, you should get an assessment for the vagus nerve. And when the vagus nerve is degenerated, we often find that there's not just stretch and compression of the vagus nerve, but there's stretch and compression of the jugular veins. And the jugular veins in the front here that run right with the vagus nerves, they drain the brain. And when they get compressed, you get high brain pressures. High brain pressures, of course, can cause uh, brain problems and the brain doesn't function right and eventually you can get neurodegeneration. This is what a degenerated uh, vagus nerve looks like. And again, poor diet can cause vagus nerve degeneration, chronic emotional stress, chronic structural stress, which is what we're talking about, upper cervical instability or a condition called cervical destructure. Destruction means that the person had a, you know, they could have a concussion or they could have a whiplash injury or they could be chronically looking at a cell phone and the neck curve reverse and that neck curve reversing can cause stretch and compression of the vagus nerve and cause the vagus nerve cells to die. So the treatment should be healthy diet, laughter, exercise, pets, you know, anything that gives joy, love, caring, compassion to the person. I'm a strong proponent of working on growing in your love for people. And there's many ways to do that. I think one of the best ways to learn how to love people is get in the nitty gritty of people's lives. I'm here again interviewing one of our amazing patients, Giovanna from, you said El Paso? And then you're here for your third prolotherapy yes. visit, right? And just thank you for being here. And your case is actually very unique. So how old are you, if I can ask? 28. And you have already had strokes, right? Three mini strokes that we didn't know they were mini strokes. So I thought, you know, it'd just be good to hear your story and then, you know, how the care here has helped you with your symptoms. So you were fine like until like a year ago or two years ago? I, I always had like some anxiety opposed to my twin sister. Um, she, but, she doesn't have any anxiety? No, not really. Okay, okay. Um, and I got COVID summer of 2021. Okay. And after that, I did notice, like, I was feeling a little weird. Um, mm -hmm. But around, like, six months after I got COVID in the gym, I was doing a leg press, and I felt like a tear. Like, something literally tore here. Now I know it was, like, my tendon, probably. Um, and then after that, I just felt like I was walking on a boat when I was just standing normal, um, like headaches every day. My head felt so like fuzzy at night. I couldn't read. I would like be on Twitter and I would have to read a tweet like five times because it didn't make sense. Like I didn't know what I was reading. Um, and my first mini stroke, I was in yoga because I used to love to go to yoga. I would go like four times a week. Yeah. And I was doing a downward dog and then I just felt like my right side go numb and I collapsed. But I didn't. I thought maybe I just hadn't had enough food that day. Um, so I started going to a chiropractor. I thought I had a pinched nerve and they would do manual Mani manipulation with my head. And two times after my chiropractor uh, sessions, 24 hours later, I had too many strokes until I was like, oh my goodness, I think the adjustments are making me mm -hmm. have these weird um, so I was in the ER twice um, and the neurologist, she was like, you just have anxiety, like okay. get over it. Here's some anxiety pills. And I was so sad that day. Like that was just horrible because I knew there was like something wrong. And then I started Googling and then I found your videos and now I'm in one. So that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. No, but I, we appreciate. So then what were the symptoms that 
you went to the ER for? Because you said mini strokes. There must have been some significant symptom that yeah. caused you to be so worried that you would go to the ER. Yeah, the first time I went to the ER was, I was really, I was like, whoa, this is serious. I was driving um, down like a highway and then I just felt like a heat flash mm -hmm. overcome me and then my eyes kind of like dilated and I felt like I was kind of going blind and I had my dog with me. I was like, I'm gonna kill us both. Like. Yeah. what's going on and then I kind of like gathered myself to pull over mm -hmm. um, but I was like I couldn't really feel my arms and I was like shaking but by the time the paramedics got there they're like you had an anxiety attack while you were driving and I was like what but while that was happening I felt like so much pain on my neck mm -hmm. and now that I've analyzed it it felt like someone like passed scissors through my neck so I guess the little bit of my tendons that were still like holding my head up like that was the last straw for them and I felt like someone like so that's when I thought like something's wrong with my neck okay what about the second time um the second time I was just watching a movie on the couch with my sister and I was like leaning on her legs yeah and when I got up my whole right side went numb again okay. and she saw it I was like it's happening and she started just freaking out so that was the second time we went to the ER Okay, and then were the MRIs okay? Um, they didn't want to do an MRI of my neck for okay. some reason. I they, think they, they did an MRI of your brain. Of my brain, and she's and the neurologist was okay. like, everything's fine. Like, okay, you're crazy, basically. So okay. I kind of went home really discouraged. There must have been some symptoms that you wanted help with, like when you came here. So mm -hmm. what were the symptoms that were? Um, that drove you to come here? Mostly I wasn't able to sleep for some reason. I would just fall asleep, but I felt like I was falling. Okay. Like I would have these jolts. Um, the my, jolts in the body or jolts in the brain? Kind of in the brain, but they yeah. felt like, no. I, I just call them brain zaps. Mm -hmm. Like you were getting brain zaps. Strange, and of course the mini strokes, not knowing like if that was going to happen again. Um, just like fuzziness, headaches vision problems especially my right eye always felt like there was something in it and when when we ran tests it's like the ocular pressure was really high or something so that made sense okay um did the numbness in the right side of your body did that go away uh yes almost completely um even okay. my right leg would go numb sometimes yeah. and now like my legs are fine okay and then was your swallowing okay your digestive tract before you came in um, no, I would have horrible heartburn. Like, it okay. would wake me up at night. I sometimes thought I was having a heart attack from how much my chest hurt. Okay. So my relationship with food was, like, just horrible because I knew if I ate something, it would feel like it was stuck in my chest. Mm -hmm. And after my second prolo, I no more heartburn. Like, I can eat a cheeseburger now. Oh, awesome. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now, did you have any other symptoms that we haven't covered before you came here? Like, did you have vertigo, dizziness, ringing in the ears? Yes. Any other? Okay, so why don't you explain those? Um, I would have some dizziness or I'd be just standing, but I felt like I was like on a boat. Yeah. Um, I could hear my heartbeat like in my ear. Both ears or just your right one? More on my right ear. Okay. Um, and sometimes it sounds so strange, but I could f listen to the electricity like I could hear okay. just like not a regular buzzing just like I could hear electricity so strange. just in the right one mm -hmm. okay um what else my hands would hurt so much like I'd be cutting an okay. onion and my hands would just like really really hurt okay and then so you've had two prolotherapy visits and then you did the curve correction yes. with us okay. and you're going to get evaluated for your third prolotherapy visit so explain you know what's better maybe what's not better definitely my uh, digestive system has like now now I can eat so of course my relationship with food has gotten much better just like after two prolotherapies my anxiety has gone down a lot do you think I get back to your baseline or um, Sometimes what happens too, and you, you know this, Giovanna, like I've often said a lot of times the system was breaking down. Like what happens in the human body is you get some ligament injury like in your neck, you know, and that can just come from you, you know, because I think your job involves a lot of computer work and da-da-da. So you could have had like the 
body, the muscles will tighten and the body will do fairly well. But at some point when the body can't compensate anymore for the ligament injury, that's when the whole system like goes awry. Once it goes awry, there isn't anything else the body can do to save itself yeah. or, or help itself. So that's when you start getting these symptoms. And, that, and because modern medicine doesn't address the ligament problem, mm -hmm. you know, they, they just say that it's, you know, it's in your head, you're mm -hmm. an anxious female, mm -hmm. you know, and of course that's just degrading really. Yeah, and absolutely the x-rays we got the first time, mm -hmm. you looked at them and you said, that it seems like I've had my neck curve kind of off for many years. So I think I was able to still live like that. Yeah. But when I tore my ligaments, then that's when things got out of control. Um, and luckily I found you yeah. on YouTube. And um, so after my treatment, I can just live a normal, even better life than, than before my ligaments tore. Okay, so the digestive's better, the anxiety's better. Probably your brain functions probably a lot better. My breathing. Right? Oh, okay. Um, Why don't you explain that? Because you did have some unusual breathing. Symptoms. I would catch myself yawning a lot all the time, having to breathe from my mouth, even though I know that it's not that it's not good, um, and just getting tired, even like showering, washing my hair. Just my arms would be so tired. I would feel so out of breath. And now I can breathe so much better and I have more energy and more Like you can stamina. breathe through your nose or mm -hmm. whatever. Okay. And then you said you had some visual things? Yes. Um, like can you describe them? Um, well, I couldn't read after yeah. a long day, which I didn't know was my brain was building up all day from like dead cells. Yeah. I learned in one of your videos. Um, so by the end of the day, I couldn't read. Like I couldn't really think. And now... I can, I can make sense of what I'm reading. My eyes don't dance around, so feeling much better with that. Then, eyesight. yeah, you you had mentioned it was almost like you were on a boat and things were moving. Mm -hmm. So has that gone away? That has gone away. Okay. Since the first problem. That's great. I think another interesting thing about your story is tell us about what you do for a living. I work with uh, refugees. Um, I work for. Jesuit Refugee Services, I guess it's a good time to promote the work we do. And I recruit volunteers around the country to connect refugees to get assistance from from just normal folks who want to help. Okay, so how would they contact you? Um, the refugees, we meet them at shelters okay. or we get referrals yeah. from other people. And then the volunteers, I reach out to them mostly online to okay, try so to what, recruit. Okay, well, so what, how would somebody contact you that they want to help the refugees, like they, like in their community? So how would they, what, um, do they email you or what's the email? They can email me and I could share it and we can put it in the link. Okay, um, that sounds so good. So that's a good way to get involved and any small way helps, whether it's so donations it's, or whatever. And it's basically refugees from all over the world. Yes, mostly we were working with uh, people from Afghanistan and Ukraine because of what's been happening recently. But at the shelters where I live at the border, we meet people from uh, Central America, South America, Mexico. Awesome. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. And then you and I had mentioned, you had mentioned, you weren't necessarily raised in a religious home, but your faith has really made an impact on yes. you. So why don't you explain a little bit about that? Um, we didn't we grew up catholic but like what they call like bad catholics who don't go to church uh but around college when i was having a lot of anxiety i started reading more into meditation but then that somehow led me to like learning about jesus so now we go to church on sundays yeah. um which used to take up like a lot of energy just to sit there at church with yeah. the lights and the music and yeah. now it's like like I'm just happy to be there and now I feel more peaceful. Like I can sit there for yeah. longer thanks to the prolotherapies. Um, but if it weren't for my faith, I don't think I would have been able to keep up with like managing symptoms, keeping a positive outlook. I'm just so blessed that, oh, that it happened. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And you ready to get your third one? Yes, I'm about to get it. After this video, I'm ready. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Hauser. And yeah, I just want to say I hope um, God grants Dr. Hauser many, many more years to help people like me um, so that 
we can just live better lives. And I read a supermodel, actually, she posted a post the other day about physical symptoms of anxiety. Mm-hmm. I read all of them and I thought that sounds like cervical instability. Okay. So I think a lot more people should know whether their anxiety is coming from their neck or if they're just like making it up like a lot of people think. Thank you so much. Yeah. The reason, you know, Mary and I go to church, you know, the reason why we go to church is that uh, we need to be reminded, one, that God loves us. Two is God wants us to love other people. So if we're receiving God's love in its fullness, we're going to be full of love and then we have love to give. And church is just uh, people who are like-minded, who need the love of God in their lives. And the Jesus taught that you'll know that people are my disciples by their love for one another. And I would just encourage everybody to make it your goal every year, your main goal every year is to grow in your love for God, grow in your love for yourself, grow in love for other people. And when I say grow in your love for yourself, it means that the God of the universe decided before the creation of the universe that he wanted you in it because he could have created a world where you weren't in it. Like he could have created a universe without Ross Hauser in it. But because Ross Hauser's in it, um, you know, he must have a purpose for me. And for anybody out there who says, ah, I'm not sure God exists. Well, we now know that uh, a skunk is different from a human being because of the DNA. And the DNA is a code, so there had to have been a coder. Like the coder made the DNA of a skunk such that a baby skunk knows that when there's danger, it's supposed to lift up its leg and spray its predator, right? A skunk just isn't afraid of anything. Like it'll, because the spray will just <laughs> get everybody away. So we know that the DNA is a code and the code is information. So it means that the coder is intelligent and uh, went through all the effort of having skunks and mosquitoes and human beings and all their DNA is different. So I call the coder God. And I believe that God has a purpose for me. And one of the main purposes is to share his love uh, or here and around the globe or anybody that I can in contact with. So one of the things that made, has made my job more enjoyable, and you know, there are many of us who struggle maybe even in a marriage or in, in their work, like it's not as enjoyable as it once was, but if you work on growing in your love for people, right? If you don't grow in it, you're gonna, the love, your love is gonna grow cold. And that's one of the things that Jesus taught is the love of most is growing cold, right? I don't wanna be that way. I want my love to grow warm, to grow hot, to grow, to grow more and more. And one of the things that I enjoy, maybe even more than the prolotherapy that I do is just getting to know people. Because think about it, do you want to meet more and more people or do you want to be more and more alone? Because if you grow in your love for people, you actually want to meet people. And I believe God put us on the planet to help each other. And it's easier to help each other if we love each other. Uh, Obviously, if somebody has chronic structural stress, they need curve correction, proper posture, and if there's instability, prolotherapy. And just a reminder, the ganglion of the... Vagus nerve sits right in front of C1. So obviously if there's ligamentous injury in the back of the neck here, the treatment to get rid of the stretch and compression of the vagus nerve is gonna be, we have to resolve the instability. We have to resolve the instability. So the C1 vertebrae just doesn't bang on and compress and stretch the vagus nerve. So the treatment of Vagus nerve degeneration induced vasal spasm would be correct the curve, which obviously involves raising one's computer 
up high, you know, whether it's standing or you're sitting. And then obviously if you're somebody who has clicking, popping, grinding in your neck and you think you have cervical instability, upper cervical instability, please get a digital motion x-ray. And if you are a candidate for prolotherapy, receive prolotherapy. Depending on how severe the instability is, the number of sessions of prolotherapy can be three sessions, five sessions, 10 sessions, it depends on how severe the instability. But just want to encourage you that if you feel like you have vagus nerve degeneration causing vasospasms, there is absolutely a lot you can do between lifestyle changes and of course, if you have a reversal of the neck curve, doing various exercises for improving your neck curve and if you have instability receiving prolotherapy and when those things are done and the cervical curve is corrected and the neck is stabilized, the prognosis is excellent to decrease the symptoms, even resolve the symptoms of vagus nerve in degeneration induced vasospasm.